Hello, dear hearts. Thank you for coming here today. We are at the dawning of a new era in extraterrestrial contact. Never before have we had so much opportunity to plant seeds about contact with the star beings in the hearts of humanity. We're having more sightings and people experiencing direct contact with interdimensional beings than ever before all around the world. So who here can feel that things are accelerating around the world, right? Everyone you must be crazy not to think they are. Uh, you'd have to be hiding underneath a rock on another planet to, to not notice you know, there's something big unfolding on our planet. And so what's happening is we are moving from a human model of reality to one that is interstellar and galactic from self-denial, they don't exist, to self-acceptance, they are part of our extended family. And so many of us are here to activate this in the awareness of society, of our families, our co-workers, our friends, our partners, so that what once was considered supernatural can become supernormal, right? So I'm interested to know how many of you in this room have had some kind of contact with extraterrestrial beings? We got, yeah, we got a few going on here, cool. I feel that each one of you in this room is here to be a bridge builder. And what that means is someone who is a pioneer ahead of their time. You are here to build bridges between the old paradigm and the new emerging consciousness on Gaia. In this new paradigm, we're here to build bridges. We're here to bring together science and spirituality our humanity with our divinity. Ancient wisdom with a modern way of living. Direct experience, so first-hand experience, which is so important, with knowledge we have gained from books. We're entering into a time where our intentions will help us to create whatever we desire. As we are upgrading from this 3D civilization to this 5D civilization. And the only thing that can limit us in this new era are our beliefs. That is the only thing that has ever limited us. And this is the final year before we are shifting into a new paradigm into 2020, when we will enter a whole new age for humanity. So if ever there was a time to align boldly with your purpose for being here, now is that time. And if you think that things are getting a little bit crazy, <laughs> wait until the next five to 10 years begin to unfold. Is anyone else excited for that, this coming era? Yes, me too, woohoo. <laughs> and so it's knowing that life is lived in cycles and from endings, new beginnings arise in consciousness. So we have to be willing to look beyond the surface even when things start to get chaotic and it looks like they are. We're, we're noticing the rumblings of that in many different um, fields. So, as a bridge between worlds, many of you here hold a unique purpose for being here at this extraordinary time in history. And it's no coincidence that you have found your way here to contact in the desert. When you start to align with your purpose for
for being here. And you do that by leaning into your discomfort and leaning into your fears. The universe will start to connect you with people, places, events that support this acceleration of your mission here. And this is how we were designed to live, to live our lives by synchronicity, to live from a space of magic and wonder that we only knew as children. For it's the children who I consider my master teachers. My name is Hono V. Strong Deer. I'm a soul purpose mentor, a medicine woman, which is just another term for a shaman, but everyone's a shaman these days, so I don't really use that word so much. An alien who's here undercover, but don't blow my cover. <laughs> but actually, you could call me uh, an ambassador for extraterrestrial contact. An ambassador kind of sounds uh, fancy schmancy, but it's, it's not really. It just means a bridge between worlds. Someone who has one foot in this world and one foot in another. Do we have any bridge builders here? Yeah, I think so. So I've been speaking at international conferences on this topic of extraterrestrial contact and aligning with your purpose since 2017. And through mentorship, I help star seeds and empaths to embody their purpose so you can really live life on your terms and be deeply in service and actually be paid to do what you love. Uh, I know it sounds like an alien concept to some people, but that's the reality I have created for myself. And so people automatically presume that I'm being abducted by like four feet bug-eyed aliens when I tell them I'm receiving communication from these star beings. But really, I'm just like you. I'm a down-to-earth person who happens to be having galactic experiences. And I know I'm not the only one. There's a lot of us in the world. Some of us are hiding, and some of us are here talking at Contact in the Desert. <laughs> we are your neighbors. We are your sisters. We're your brothers, your co-workers. We are experiencers of extraterrestrial contact. And what's allowed me to connect with people on this physical plane and beings on another plane is that I see myself as a world citizen. I don't really feel I belong to one dimension, one part of the world or place. I hold an English passport. I have a Native American name. I lived in India as a child. I grew up in the United Kingdom. And presently, I live in the Andean mountains of Peru. So quite frankly, when people ask me where I'm from, I find it difficult to answer this question. These days, I live purposefully with guidance from the stars whilst having my two feet firmly on the ground in Peru. And so let me just go to the slide here. It's a little bit about my story. So this is me looking like a giant grape <laughs> in Machu Picchu, which is down the road from where I live, a few hours away. I think it was raining that day. But I don't really care because it's Machu Picchu, and Machu Picchu is amazing. Has anyone here been there? Awesome. You got to go. It's like got to be on the bucket list. So we are surrounded 360 degrees by the Andean mountains. This is a, sh a picture showing one of the towns that we were living in previously called Galca, and now we live in a town called Lamai. And so we can see the Milky Way from our back garden. And I'm often singing to the stars with my drum. <laughs> yes, yes, please. <laughs> And I live with my soulmate, Roberto, who's sitting at the front here, and our two cats. That's me and Roberto, and some friends, and our two cats there, a swimming pool. We even have a swimming pool in the middle of the Andes. <laughs> but it wasn't always like this. 
A few years ago, I wasn't on purpose at all, or even grounded. I certainly wasn't speaking at international conferences, or even holding international retreats and workshops in Peru. Before I realized that this was part of my destiny and what I had signed up to do, I felt very confused, misunderstood, and deeply alone. So things were very different back in 2010. At the time I was in England, where my family lives, in my grandmother's bedroom. She was in India at the time, and I missed her, so I decided to sleep in her room, and it was around 3 a.m. in the morning. Suddenly, without warning, my body went into sleep paralysis. I felt a wave of electricity, vibrations moving through the top of my head, what we would call the crown chakra, all throughout my body. I was buzzing with energy as though someone had literally plugged me into an electric outlet. And I started to hear a static-like noise like this. <sighs> Similar to the sound that a television set makes before everything went digital. And slowly I started to lift, feel myself lifting outside of my physical body. Now, I was so freaking frightened at the time, I thought I was gonna faint. I literally thought I was dying. I said, oh my God, I must be dying. This is what must happen when you die. And I opened my mouth to cry out for help, but guess what, nothing came out. It was so dry. Not a single word would come out. Oh, just to let you know, I hadn't drank alcohol or smoked weed or done anything like that at all when this happened. It was a totally natural event. So, I didn't know it back then, but I had received a big spiritual awakening from someone or something, along with all kinds of downloads and visuals, and I didn't know what to do with that. There wasn't anyone who I could turn to for guidance, and life as I knew it dramatically changed after that experience. So for many years, I continued to feel this energy, which would lead me to having out-of-body experiences and without me really knowing what the hell was going on. Do we have any people in here who have out-of-body experiences or who have had? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys know what's up. <laughs> so As you can imagine, my sanity was being tested. I had insomnia, I wasn't getting any sleep, so I couldn't even eat the foods that I used to eat. Everything was flipped upside down. I became environmentally sensitive, and that meant I had to change my diet. I began to withdraw, I began to isolate um, myself from others. And I didn't know who was trying to communicate with me. All I knew was that my senses were heightened and I had a sense that it was something from beyond, but I really didn't know. Now, if that wasn't enough, you know, leaving my body every time I, my head hit the pillow, at the same time that this was occurring, I lost my job, my relationship, my apartment, the city I was living in, which was London, England at the time, it just felt like my whole world came crashing down in spectacular style all at once. And I went into this very deep, dark depression, a dark night of the soul. I completely withdrew into myself because there was no one at the time who could relate to what I was experiencing. And overnight, I became hypersensitive to multiple realities at once. So I was perceiving multiple dimensions, realities, and beings, as well as this physical dimension. And there was just literally no one I could talk to because they all probably thought I was going crazy, right? And so I reached the darkest and lowest point in my life when I would actually go to sleep crying at night. And I would wake up in the morning crying too because things had gotten so bad. And so this was like a turning point and I knew I needed unconventional help. 
So my sixth sense was growing, and I ended up going to a sacred ceremony with Mother Ayahuasca, which is an Amazonian natural brew found in South America. Do we have anyone here who has done plant medicine? Okay, we got a couple of people. And so that's when I received direct contact and confirmation as to who these beings were. This was their message. And this is literally how they spoke through me in the ceremony. We are from Sirius. <laughs> we are returning. The hybrid children are coming. So I was very surprised, and everyone in the circle was too. And so they started speaking through me in another language. Some people call this language light or star language, and it sounds something like this. Yanata eku emmayo hanna asu. There wasn't really anyone I could turn to. I mean, it's not like you can knock on your next door neighbor's door and be like, What's up? You know, what do you think about these messages I'm getting from whoever God knows what and this alien language? You know, they probably think that I was on drugs or just escaped some kind of rehab. And so I realized getting mentorship was essential and because it was going to help me get aligned and get on purpose and translate what these beings were trying to share with me and also help me to, to create meaning from this communication so that I could put these messages to good use. And now what I do is I help people, just like myself, to create meaning, to have an impact with their purpose and communicate with star beings. So if you feel like you've had a spiritual awakening, maybe you feel you've been receiving messages from the beyond, but you don't understand, or maybe you know your sole purpose is connected in some way with the star nations, I'm going to share with you in my talk three steps that can actually help you become this bridge between worlds that can be of value. And so I want you to know I'm not here to convince you or persuade you of anything. I'm really here to share from my heart to your heart. But I believe it's important to share because it could help other people who might be having similar experiences around the world. And it can actually help us build a picture of what is actually going on for experiencers of contact. So through research, I discovered the constant buzzing in the energy that I was talking about earlier that would lead to my out-of-body experiences, which I still feel to this day, by the way, is Kundalini energy. So I had received a sponta spontaneous Kundalini awakening that was initiated by these star beings. And Kundalini is a dormant energy that's in everyone, but for some reason it becomes activated in certain people. And it naturally leads to expanded states of consciousness and awareness. So I made a decision that I really wanted to start participating fully in life instead of withdrawing and fully participate with this energy in my life. This energy was serving as a platform to help me connect with these higher dimensional beings and receive telepathic communication. It awakened my sixth sense, my intuition. It made me highly sensitive to my environment. And I even stopped drinking alcohol after that. Um, and along with other lifestyle changes, too. So I got a mentor to help me navigate these changes. And he basically helped me through moments of self-doubt and shame. Because I can only speak for myself, but I felt a lot of shame around my experiences with extraterrestrial or higher dimensional beings. Because that is the culture that we have created you know, we don't make it a safe place for people to express their experiences. 
and really share from their heart and come forward, right? And so getting a mentor, all this helped me to become a bridge between worlds and become a mentor for others going through similar experiences. And so I'm going to share some steps that helped me become this bridge builder and receive these downloads from these star beings. So we came from the stars, but our destiny is to embrace our humanity. You know, our destiny has always been intertwined with the star nations. We're deeply connected with the stars. And we can see evidence for this in almost every culture around the world. From the mysterious Nazca Lines, not far from where I am in Peru, in Lima. I'm actually south of Peru, and Lima is more in the north. To prehistoric petroglyphs found in Italy. But really, our destiny is to live as humans, to embrace our humanity, to unify the stars with the earth. This is what we are each here to do. So was humanity seeded by the star nations? Seeding is basically referring to planting foreign organisms in a specific location with the intent to nurture life. And a scientist called Dr. Ellis Silver thinks that humans were actually seeded here. The evidence he has put forward is physiological features that could suggest humans have been dropped off here from another planet. He says that there's many things that seem to contradict the idea that we evolved over millions of years in our earthly environment. I'd recommend for you guys to check out this book or just type his name into YouTube or Google. So he says that reptiles use the sun to regulate their temperature, but humans need to avoid spending long periods exposed in the sun as it can cause humans to feel dizzy and cause heat stroke. He also is talking about how humans regularly suffer from bad backs. I know I've been one of those people. And uh, he's saying his theory is that it could be that it's because we evolved on a planet with much lower gravity. Really fascinating stuff. And the fact that he's a scientist, a PhD, is, is very interesting. We need more people like that to, to hypothesize these theories, because that's what science is really about. You know, everyone else on the planet is pretty happy with a low center of gravity. And meanwhile, we're wobbling around on two legs. We really stick out like a sore thumb. Um, we have extremely fine coat. We have hair that grows in strange places. We have big heads and flat feet, right? Once you start looking at things from this angle, it's very eye-opening. It kind of opens your mind and heart in a new way. And so we look more like aliens than the native animal uh, species on our planet. And so evolutionarily speaking, it took a long time for us to get you know, to this point of sharpening tools and rocks, and then jumping from that to all of a sudden inventing art, agriculture, quantum physics, you know. There's like a big gap that even scientists can't explain. So evolution normally means you adapt to your environment. But humans, we humans don't seem to want to do that. We don't seem to want to adapt. We've almost become like this virus or, or a parasite on the earth. And so also from my own understanding, when we look at the human race, it's very interesting how diverse we are. So to me, when I'm looking at different races, I'm looking at different extraterrestrial races. So when I'm looking at the black race, the Chinese, you know, the Caucasian or white, uh, Indian, why do they look so different, right? It's just something, I'm not saying it's a fact, I'm just saying, you know, putting it out there for people to contemplate 
Why do we look so different? Could it be that we actually originated from different points in the galaxy, from different systems, star systems, and that's why we look so different? So we're always looking to the stars and talking about extraterrestrials, but maybe we are the extraterrestrials that we're pointing to. And even the scientist Greg Braden talks about the chromosomes within our DNA being intentionally tampered with. He says that there's scientific evidence that's found that the DNA was manipulated by something or someone. He stopped short of saying extraterrestrials because he has a reputation as a scientist to uphold, but that's what he was suggesting. And you can find out more information about that if you just type in, you know, Greg Braden, uh, DNA, alien DNA, or something like that. There's, the, there's a bunch of stuff about it online. So it's knowing that there's a lot of ETs that are humanoid in their appearance, but in the movies, we're not shown that. We're shown these bug-eyed aliens, right? And panspermia is the hypothesis that life exists all throughout the universe and it maybe has been distributed by asteroids or comets. And there's also something called directed panspermia, which is that the idea that there's an intentional spreading of seeds of life to other planets by advanced extraterrestrial civilizations. So we have entered a more fully expanded era of cosmic consciousness. And I say cosmic consciousness has returned in awareness because it's always been by our side, but we haven't had the ability to perceive it. And so this fundamental shift is occurring and it's about us becoming, going from world citizens to galactic citizens, from 3D to 5D. Can I just, Connie, can I just get a note of the time that I have? Because we started late too. Okay, good to know. So just because we are moving into this galactic era, it doesn't mean that we just drop everything that ties us to the 3D. If that happened, our world would actually fall into chaos overnight. It would get really messy. And so this is what creates a lot of confusion for people. So the people who you think are still part of the matrix, we actually need them. And we can thank them because they're holding things together. And the tendency is to criticize them. And the challenge is to operate with one foot in this world and one foot in another as we are transitioning and guided by these higher vibrational principles. We're transitioning between two very different types of consciousness. But we are, in a sense, as bridge builders, here to unify, bridge those states together. Not to shame ourselves or others for where they might be on the consciousness spectrum. I'm sure we've all come across that in the spiritual and personal development fields. So Earth has a very distinct frequency band that has split into two. Can anyone feel that? There's a contrast of these two frequencies that feel worlds apart. It's like two different worlds are coinciding. One is everything that is relating to fear, projection, blame, control, over-analysis. And another is everything relating to awareness, compassion, vulnerability, forgiveness, unity. And we're really free to choose which one we're focusing on or giving energy to. Fear as a frequency band is just like, fear, is just like love. It can't really do anything to us unless we allow it to just pass through without creating a big story around it. And so at the moment, there's a collective shadow. Has anyone noticed that? There's a lot of heaviness going on. There's a collective shadow, a purging that is happening on our planet. 
And I like to call it one big ayahuasca ceremony. For those who have taken... <laughs> For those who have taken ayahuasca, you know what I mean. And what that means, in ayahuasca, when you drink the plant medicine, you end up being sick because it's cleansing you from the inside out. And that's what's going on symbolically in our world, too. Because another thing to think about is when you chase after the light, you cast a shadow, right? Right? And a lot of us have been used to just trying to portray how everything's a bed of roses when it's not. And it's going to become increasingly difficult to try and show people that, you know, everything's okay when it might not be. And that's what's happening on the international stage, too. So we're each being called on in this time to go into a state of surrender right, to everything that's been holding us back. So all the resistance, the fear, the pain, the grief, the competition. And instead of resisting these emotions or trying to escape them, which is what we've been conditioned to do in our society, or shame ourselves or others, we're being invited to embrace this shadow aspect, to surrender, to allow to, to shed the old layers like a snake that's shedding its skin. And one of the things that these beings, these guides, told me recently was that humanity as a collective has many barriers up towards letting love in, being receptive to love, to joy, to unity, to collaboration, which are all um, offshoots of this frequency love. And they said it's due to the deep conditioning and fear that dominates this 3D reality. And you know what? Some people might call me a dreamer up here, and that's okay. Because it was the dreamers of this world who helped to revolutionize whole movements. Not just dreamers, but people who were willing to put conviction behind their words with aligned action. So this is interesting. I don't know if some people might have seen this before. It's an article talking about a university implementing a course about aliens to prepare people for extraterrestrial contact. If this isn't proof that we are shifting in our consciousness collectively, then I don't know what is, <laughs> right? So the person who has created this, I believe he's actually at this conference. I don't know what his name is, but I believe he's at this conference. And he is a pioneer, like many of you here. He is a, build, a bridge builder, like myself, and like many of you. So I'm going to go to some of the downloads, because this is like the, the cool part that I receive from these beings. So they said, love me is equivalent in human words to the frequency heard by non-terrestrial beings when they tune into the vibration of humanity on Gaia. I mean, I was taken aback when I got this download through a telepathic exchange whilst meditating. In essence, they're implying that as a whole, our world is starved of love, that love is not a dominant frequency on our planet. And that pretty much everyone here is crying out to be loved, either to crying out to be loved or to give love to others. And that all actions in a real sense can be traced back to this one sentence, love me. Even the most destructive acts that are born from fear, it's from a lack of love. It's for, it's for a cry of, for love. And they said that this is the frequency, the star seeds who are here on this planet in their millions heard, which motivated them to incarnate as humans at this pivotal point in history. And a star seed is basically just someone who has some kind of connection, they feel, to extraterrestrial civilizations or to higher dimensional planes of reality. They know there's something different about them. 
They also say that time is a 3D construct. Predictions are a 3D construct that keep you locked into a linear time space. Looking always for evidence and proof is a 3D narrative. They say many of you are still using 3D concepts to try to navigate and understand a fifth dimensional reality that's being birthed on your planet. And so it's kind of like we're, we're trying to put square pegs into round holes, if you can think of it like that. They're encouraging us to go outside the box, to color outside the lines, because modern civilization is sometimes overly focused on log the logical and linear, and they're missing the bigger picture, the bigger cosmic puzzle. And so everything is being turned on its head in a whole new way. In effect, this upgrade in, in consciousness is encouraging us to relate to each other in ways most people have never related to each other. It goes against all programming and conditioning. And even it's counterintuitive to a lot of people too. Because we're not used to thinking from a nonlinear space at all. But we must really go beyond our fixations and to really start meeting these beings where they're at and try to really understand and embody these messages that they're sharing. So they say there is one truth, there are many truths. Both statements are true for the one who perceives them. What they're trying to say here is that inclusivity is the name of the game. When we invalidate someone else because they are perceiving or believing in something different to ourselves, we are coming from a very fear-based limiting consciousness. And they're encouraging us to go beyond what we think is right and what we think is true and to be inclusive of many different perspectives. This is also a loving approach. Most of the messages I receive from these beings are always, always, always pointing back to love. This is like their main uh, message. Because the conditioning here is all about it has to be like this or it has to be like that. But they're saying that it's a bit of this and that. It's not, they're not saying it has to be just like this or that or giving an ultimatum. But that's how we're used to thinking on, on this earth. And so they also were, were sharing with me that sometimes science, and we're talking about mainstream science really, not the new science, but science can sometimes invalidate other perspectives. And does that remind you of any other system of thought? That's what they said to me. And I was like, huh, well, religion does that too. <laughs> and they said, yeah. They said they're, they're not being inclusive. And so, like I said, we're referring to mainstream science as it's taught in educational institutions and systems, not the quantum or new science that's rising in people's consciousness and that is progressive. So... It's important to know that when it comes to this topic of extraterrestrial contact, everyone's at a different stage in their awareness, in their remembrance, in their ability to understand and, in a sense, assimilate this information. So some of you here will be more scientifically inclined, and I welcome that. That's part of your belief system, but please understand that this is not the belief system for others, right? And that's what they're trying to say to us. They're trying to encourage us to be inclusive of many different belief systems. Because maybe some people have had direct contact and communication, which really does change your life in profound ways. It really does. I mean, it's one thing reading about UFOs, watching the X-Files or whatever, uh, Secure Team on YouTube. I don't know if anyone watches that. But it's another to have your own direct experiences. And so those of us who are from ancient and indigenous cultures like myself, we don't require the same belief system to assimilate this information, right? We're not coming from that perspective. But that doesn't mean that our perspective is not valid. 
Because I, just to make clear, I love science. I love science and I love spirituality. And that is the new paradigm. That is the new era that we're going into. So often I receive communication through a variety of modalities. It's not just plant medicine. I don't, I'm not just doing plant medicine like every weekend, you know. Um, I meditate, dreams, out-of-body experiences. Sometimes plant medicine messages will come through. Sometimes I'm doing none of these things, and I just catch one of these downloads. That's what I call it, a download. It's like a package of information that I receive that starts to unfold and unravel itself through telepathic communication. And it's important to note that there is information from various extraterrestrials and different channels and beings and teachers and mentors that contradict each other. Just like on Earth, people share information that contradicts. One of the reasons is because we're talking about beings residing in many different dimensions. Each dimension has a different governing principle, law, and rule. And as we expand in consciousness, one truth makes another obsolete or one truth is no longer relevant to the one who is perceiving and experiencing it. So the beings I commune with are ninth dimensional and beyond, the very high level guides. In fact, that's been one of my challenges to make lifestyle adjustments to accommodate to the high frequency that these beings emit. I literally become like a child when they contact. When they make contact, I start laughing like a child, crying like a child. They have so much love, it's unbelievable. It's not the kind of love we are used to experiencing on this earth, and it's really a blessing for me. And so the thing is, we're used to pitting, our, pitting ourselves against another aspect of ourselves. But what I, what I mean by that, when I say another aspect of ourselves, they are getting me to start using this terminology where I'm looking at others as an aspect of me. They always say, embrace other as self. And so they're saying that we're kind of being in competition with each other, and pitting ourselves against each other, and this is not going to solve the issue. Because they're saying that it's coming from a fear mentality, and we have to really rethink how we're approaching everything. So the other thing that they always say to me, they say, we are returning 2033. They always say this, always, always, always. Now. I'm not sure, like, uh, you know, even I have doubts myself. I'm actually a very discerning person. Even though they give me downloads, I'm not just like, okay, you know, whatever, I'll just believe what you say. And I'm very discerning. I'm always questioning. I'm always challenging them. And even sometimes I have doubts. I'm like, are they really coming in 2033? Like, oh, my God, you know. But this is the date that they keep giving me. It looks like something significant is going to occur on this date. They say that love has no opposite at all. They say that sometimes we talk about love having an opposite, like the opposite of love is fear. But this goes back to what I was saying earlier. That's coming from a certain level of consciousness. Can you see that that's coming from a certain level of consciousness? It doesn't mean it's not valid and it's not true. It is for the one who is experiencing and perceiving. But on another level of truth, love has no opposite. It's all encompassing, right? And that's what they're trying to get us to think outside the box. And they always say, we are all in each other. See other as self, rather than seeing self as other. So rather than seeing someone else as someone who is not part of your family, see them as your family. See them as yourself, you know? Because we are used to our family being our blood but we're not used to embracing our family on the other side of the planet or the next door neighbor with the annoying dog or whatever, right? So this is an interesting survey in ET contact worldwide. 
It was the first ever global survey in extraterrestrial life conducted in 24 countries by research group Glocalities, and 26,000 people responded. And so in the findings of the survey conducted in these 24 countries, it showed that 47% of the surveyed people believe in the existence of intelligent extraterrestrial uh, civilizations in the universe. And it's the largest poll of its kind with such a global reach. The interviews were conducted in 15 languages between December 2015 and February 2016 in countries representing 62% of the world's population and 80% of the global economy. So the Glocality's study on the existence of alien life was completed and it reveals that there's many more cultures and people believing in ET contact than we can imagine. And it's important to remember that this topic will remain taboo and controversial as long as people like yourselves don't come forward and start sharing with whoever, with your mother, with your brother, with your friends, and informing the mass collective. Maybe one of you guys will be up here talking about extraterrestrial contact and planting seeds in, in the collective consciousness. It's interesting because it says Turkey is the least likely, but someone in Turkey in the earlier slide created the first university that's going to have a, a course preparing people for extraterrestrial contact, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And so there's a cultural divide with the extraterrestrial phenomena. So I was in LA, I just got here a couple of weeks ago uh, from Peru, and I was talking to a taxi driver. And of course, what happened, I ended up talking about aliens, my favorite, my favorite topic, right? And he's like, extraterrestrials, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Followed by, well, let me take you out for dinner and we can uh, you know, discuss it further. What, what do you think about that? After I told him, what if he was talking to an alien right now? <laughs> I was getting him to think outside the box. So a few weeks prior to that, I was in Mexico City at the ancient site of Teotihuacan. And the taxi man there, when I asked him about you know, extraterrestrials, he said, see, sí, yes, extraterrestrials, they are our ancestors. Isn't it amazing, the difference, right? And so this is something that we have to remember, that the extraterrestrial phenomenon, is a, it, it divides people culturally. And so I can see how I have been lucky because I actually grew up in England, believe it or not. I don't have a, an English accent, but I've lived all over the world. Um, and I took the best of both worlds, so the left brain logic and the right brain vision, and, and had them work together. And really, we are each being invited to meet on this bridge between worlds and leave behind our filters and our beliefs and our projections and welcome other people's perspectives and other cultures, too. Because maybe for 80% of the world, the phenomena of extraterrestrial activity is nothing new at all. In Peru, where I live, the local people, they're often sharing their stories about ships emerging from the great lake of Titicaca to the inner earth, which the Peruvian Andes are said to be a portal to. And so there's many different belief systems in this room. But what you have to remember about me is that I did not grow up exclusively in a Western culture because my family is of Indian origin. So I have a different frame of reference to some people in here. It doesn't mean that my frame of reference is not more valid or that yours is not valid either. It just means it's different, it's a different perspective. And I really invite everyone to open up to these different perspectives in heart and mind. And so there's a prophecy 
In the Amazon and Andes, a prophecy of the eagle and condor, it forewarns of human societies splitting into two paths, that of the eagle and that of the condor. And the path of the condor is really of the heart and intuition and the feminine, which is what we were talking about earlier. And the eagle and condor prophecy says that the 1490s would begin a 500-year period during which the eagle people who are more centered in their logic and in their analysis would become so powerful that they would almost eliminate the condor people. And so we can look at colonization and genocide as an example. Many people killing in the name of monarchs and ego and power trips and greed and a very patriarchal system, which has kind of been a testament to this prophecy. So the prophecy of the ego, the north is the masculine and the intellect and the condor which they refer to the South, is the feminine energy, the heart, feeling, and intuition. But it also foretells a coming time when the two shall fly together. And I believe that we are in that time once again, where, these, where the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine will come together in union. But the thing is, this prophecy, it exists as a potential there is a high probability, but it's not guaranteed to us unless we live and embody that potential through aligning with our purpose and being the change we want to actually witness. So it's really important to, to note that a lot of contact is actually telepathic and paranormal in its very nature. But within ufology, there is an overemphasis on the physicality of contact, and it invalidates all other contact modalities. It's really important for us to get on board with this. So at the moment in ufology in recent years was overly focusing on evidence and data and those little four feet bug-eyed aliens, right? And now there is a shift away from that as we start to realize that contact is, is not just about the physical aspect because we're dealing with beings who are multidimensional. A lot of them aren't even physical, you know, they're interdimensional beings. And the message we're being encouraged to move towards is this balance of spirituality and science coming together in union. Because this is the main message that the ETs want to get across. They want to get these spiritual ideas across. They want to talk about love, and they want us to embody that. So all my encounters with these beings have been psychic or telepathic through meditation, dream encounters, out-of-body experiences, and plant medicine work. I have some tell signs when these beings make contact. For instance, the top of my head, otherwise known as the crown chakra, it starts to vibrate very intense. That's when I know they're coming through. Also, my third eye area, it starts to vibrate too. And my heart center, I start to feel activity in my heart. And that's when I know. I'm like, OK, here they come. <laughs> but I'm also discerning. So like I said earlier, when I receive communication, I'll often challenge them. Like, why does it have to be that way? Who says so? And they think it's kind of cute. <laughs> you know, because most people's egos get affected by ET contact, and they become fragmented they start to think they're more special. They develop a savior complex, which is not uncommon at all. I've actually dealt with clients. Um, one client came to me who believed he was the reincarnation of Jesus. He literally was convinced that he was Jesus um, because he was having these contact experiences. But 
he didn't have anyone to talk to because a lot of people just thought he was crazy. And uh, I had compassion for him. I can see how destabilizing it can be when you're having contact with the most loving beings ever. Because let's face it, our planet, it's just not, we're not giving that frequency out to each other. So when we encounter that, we start floating off into space and thinking we're Jesus and all kinds of things, right? So it's very important to be very grounded. And I have certain grounding practices and certain people that keep me in check so that my ego doesn't start floating off to Mars or whatever. And it's always important to remember that we can always find the evidence for what we each believe is true about reality. For some, the overwhelming evidence is never going to be enough. Never. <laughs> Just like the taxi man in L.A. from the airport. I said to him, you do realize that the government has admitted to having a section that was dedicated to researching UFOs. They've released footage of UFO. He's like, no. <laughs> so, you know, it's very important to note that Evidence can take us so far. It will only take us so far with certain people, right? Because ultimately, the evidence that we are putting forward may not conform to people's programming and cultural conditioning. Perhaps I'm sharing some things that might be triggering some people in the room right now because it's not part of their belief system or their culture or whatever, right? So this is how we all think ascension should be, you know, it's like angels and uh, this is how we think contact maybe would look, <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, <laughs> and, um, but it's not always like that, is it? For me, it's kind of like, more like this. <laughs> It's like, oh, you know, why am I here on this earth? What's going on? What's ascension? Why is everything falling apart, right? So I think within this field of disclosure and uh, spiritual, spirituality and personal development, we have some distortions that we need to be aware of because we didn't come to the earth to ascend our humanity and, and for everything to be perfect, we have come to descend into our humanity. And so has anyone ever felt like this lady in the photo here? I know I, know I have. And so as the higher frequencies are entering, all the denser frequencies are being purged, and we won't be able to keep our skeletons hidden in the closet, right? So meaning all thought and action based on these lower forms of consciousness, such as greed and control and manipulation and anger, all of this is being purged right now. This is why we have the Me Too movement and other movements in consciousness, because the direction in which we're going, all that kind of stuff will not be allowed to continue. So, like I said, we came here to descend into our human avatar and ascend into our multi- dimensional being. And so how do we become these bridges between worlds? Well, the first step is surprising to a lot of people, and it's about creating and cultivating what I call is wealth consciousness. And I want you to just bear with me a moment, especially those of you that might be triggered by this a little bit. And so a bridge, a person that is building bridges, as we were saying earlier, is someone who connects worlds, realities, and paradigms. But strangely, have you noticed how we are programmed to be okay with earning money doing a crappy job we dislike or even hate? But when it comes to earning money doing something we love, people seem to have a hard time wrapping their head around it. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. <laughs> I've noticed it. I mean, how many people do you know in your life who truly love their job? Not many people at all. So welcome to Earth where things are a little bit back to front. And 
what I invite you to think about is that maybe business can be a spiritual endeavor. Sounds like an alien concept to some people. Because for a while, business, spirituality, economics, commerce, marketing, sales, they've all been kept separate, right? One over here, one over there. And people think being spiritual is, is like living like the Dalai Lama, right? Going off, meditating in a cave somewhere, reaching enlightenment. But is this spirituality or is this us trying to escape from reality? Because that's what it sounds like to me. And that's something I invite you to think about. Because the new paradigm is about bringing together many different areas into a holistic whole, business and spirituality, service and sales, right? So how many people of you, how many people in the room here actually feel triggered in some way or have some kind of charge when I talk about money and spirituality? Thank you for being honest. I know I used to. I used to be one of those people too. And so there's a massive shadow around those who think they're spiritual and then the true spiritual path is about being less materialistic. It's often a distortion. It's a, it's a misunderstanding. It's a distortion of the principle called abundance. And so I see many people going backwards and not living into their potential and their purpose as a result of holding on to this belief system. You know, there's even those who teach others how less materialism is the way to salvation. But is that going to help us be a bridge between worlds? Not necessarily. As if living in poverty is somehow going to fix the very real issues that face our planet. It's knowing that the spiritual and the material are two sides of the same coin. And if you disconnect and deny materialism, you won't be in a position to have much of an impact as a bridge builder in this world, in this realm. So it's not more spiritual to have less materially. And the skill that requires you to make an impact in our society, it requires you to be here now and coming into peace with materialism, not making an enemy of it. Can you each imagine the shift that would occur when all the healers and the light workers, the star seeds, the empaths, the change makers, imagine all of them were living financially abundant and free? So spirituality has nothing to do with whether you have a bunch of stuff or not. That's a, that's a massive misinterpretation. So I've met people who have a lot of material stuff and they're really amazing people, really kind. And then I've met people who don't have much material stuff and they don't treat people very kindly at all. So that's not indicative of whether you're spiritual or not. And also, when we look at nature, at Mother Nature, who is one of my master teachers, the other master teacher for me are children, it's not like we say, oh my God, Mother Nature, why do you have to be so damn greedy with all those stars and mountains and rivers? I mean, it sounds pretty ridiculous when we think about it, right? We wouldn't say that to nature, and nature is teaching us all the time that there is abundance, and that's how we're meant to live our lives. And this is also a message I get from the star nations, the star nation of Sirius. So number two would be participating in life instead of withdrawing. So the extent to which we are showing up and participating in our life equals the extent to which we can be a bridge between worlds and create abundance for all. And we create, you know, we become this bridge by responding to what comes into our immediate field of awareness. We're not waiting for the extraterrestrials to come, or God, or Jesus, or whoever. And this looks like, in practical terms, it looks like helping those who come to us for help. Our focus should always be, how can I 
help? Or how can I love? Ask yourself this when someone comes to you, maybe in the conference in the next few days, just get into a little experiment and ask yourself that question and start seeing magical things happen. So the desire to do things perfectly also prevents us from moving forward. We got any perfectionists in here? I, I used to be one of those. And it really held me back moving forward in my life. But life is just requiring you to fully participate and dance with it. So sometimes we're trying to escape our humanity through spirituality, through spiritual I ideals, and through meditation, and even through science. But we didn't come here to ascend our humanity. That's not being a bridge builder at all. Right? We came to bring heaven on earth. This is what we're here to do. And so it's important to see the value in both worlds and different paradigms, to be a connector between ideas. The third point, I think, is the point that most people struggle with. To be a bridge builder is to be fearless, courageous, and to share vulnerably. Most people are afraid to be vulnerable, but that's the very thing that our world so desperately needs. Vulnerability is freedom, and it's how we become bridge builders. When we're willing to be vulnerable, and we really show people who we are, then it really creates a space for others. It gives them permission to be who they are, too, even if they're falling apart. And so we're entering this age of transparency where people are becoming truly authentic, right, and, uh, and vulnerable. And that's because people are craving connection. Connection is currency. Remember that. When you connect with people, this is what is creating synchronicity and acceleration. And it's knowing that love is breaking all the known rules of the game so I encourage each of you to share parts of yourself that feel comfortable, and that, that is a little bit of a stretch. That's how you become this bridge builder. And so from deep inside, there is a desire to be seen, and alongside that, a deep fear of being seen. Can anyone relate to that? A desire of being seen, but also a deep fear of being seen. That's been part of my journey. And it's knowing that self-expression isn't an invitation for everyone to love us or even like us. You know, that's one of the things that really holds people back from being authentic because we want people to like us. But it's, this is not about a popularity contest, right? We have a bonus step, too. And that is a very important step, becoming more receptive to this idea of multidimensional awareness, actually seeing the value in both worlds, not giving precedence to one over the other, engaging in things like meditation, lucid dreaming, astral projection, creating daily rituals and routines, designing a lifestyle that feeds into that. One of the things the Syrian beings also say to me is be like the children. They're always saying that to me all the time. And I think as adults, we, we really can get disconnected from that. So doing things that really bring us that childlike wonder and innocence and joy is going to help you become that bridge builder and ground. And also embracing the divine feminine. The ETs have said to me on several occasions, where are your women? And they were talking about conferences, actually. <laughs> and they said, you need to encourage your women to step forward, to lead, because they're integral to the shift in global consciousness that's occurring on the planet. And I was like, wait, I'm a woman. They were like, well, duh. So here I am. <laughs> So it's knowing that discomfort is the new comfort. I'm going to go through some of these slides a bit quicker because I know we have, we're pushed for time a little bit here. 
And so this is a download I got from the Star Nation series. They said, when the frequencies on Earth heighten, as they are in these times, all perceived negativity from self and other as self are magnified tenfold. All seemingly negative events and people are made visible worldwide and put under a magnifying glass so that they can harmonize with the new fourth density, also known as fifth dimension, octave pouring into Gaia. And that was relating to what I was sharing earlier about this purging, about this shadow effect going on in our planet. And so it's knowing that we are living in an entangled universe. You can take one quantum particle and it's entangled with another. And what you do to one responds in the same way. And so it changes the same way. And it doesn't matter how far these particles are from each other. When you change one, the other changes as well. And this could be applied to everything. So quantum particles are everywhere. They're inside us. They're what make up matter. And in reality, you could say everything is entangled. Some people, they don't understand that when they're talking about extraterrestrials, they think that they're traveling long distances. They're like, how the hell are they doing it, you know? Um, but it's not necessarily the right way to think about it. They don't just get in a car or a rocket or some 1940s Cadillac technology or something that propels them from one part of the universe to another. They are using quantum. They're interdimensional beings. This is why it's important to open up to different types of contact, not just physical, but telepathic Mm -hmm. So who are these star beings? They operate as a group consciousness, and they often begin the, their sentences as, we are many, but we are one. They don't have a name, but they gave me the name Arya and said to look up the term because it has multiple meanings. Arya is the name that they gave that represents their vibration. Because they have actually evolved past physicality, they're not physical beings, they're ninth dimensional. So they recognize each other by energetic signature. And it literally means air. In Sanskrit, it means pure and noble. In Albanian, it means from gold. And in Hebrew, lioness of God. And so when I channel these beings these kind star beings, I can no longer say the word I. It won't come out of my mouth. When I try to say I, I'm like, ah, ah. <laughs> it won't come out. It's really amazing to witness. Only we are or us, that, that's what comes out. And also this different language also comes out of my mouth. At one point, I, I can't speak English any longer. And they told me that English... Every language has a frequency. Um, and sorry to say to English speakers, because I speak different languages too, they said that English is one of the lower uh, frequency languages. And they said languages like Chinese, for instance, is a very high vibrational language. It's a very tonal language. Very interesting. This is the photo of, of the, one of the beings that is part of the collective. It's a depiction of one of these beings as part of this group collective called Arya. And you can see that she looks very humanoid, not a little bit bug-eyed, but not too much. And they normally speak to me as a collective, and there's an artist called Vashta who did this piece. And I believe they carefully select what they appear as, because remember, they're non-physical beings. They actually exist as pure consciousness or light. They can take on any form they want. But I believe they specifically chose to take on the form of a black woman, especially because humanity has many issues still with race. And so it's no surprise to me that they took on this amazing form to challenge people's preconceptions on race. They also said to me one time, there are what we call many emissaries of light on your planet at this time. 
They are angels in earthly form that walk your earth. Sometimes they are wearing the most unusual disguises, the homeless, the downtrodden, and impoverished. Do not turn a blind eye to these angels in disguise. So I'm going to have to whiz through some of this, but in the very beginning of my presentation, I said that this star or light language started to come through. It actually started in my dreams. Some people think it started when I did plant medicine. And also, as a note, I took a break from all plant medicine for one year and two months, and the communication continued. So I don't want you guys to think this is just happening as a result of this plant medicine. It's not. And so light language is an ancient, nonlinear inner technology. It's a form of multidimensional communication, which is returning in consciousness. If you type it into Google, you'll actually get a bunch of results. It's not just me who is having these downloads. There's many other people. The script at the bottom is what I wrote. These are some of the scripts and things that I see in visuals when I get downloads. This is another set, kind of looks almost like Chinese. Um, a lot of my friends who are receiving similar downloads, they also write these scripts on paper, and they seem to almost resemble uh, ancient languages of the earth. There's another one here. This is a, a piece, a commission piece that I did for a client. This is the colored version, and there's different colors. I am also an artist. And this client was having problems with being attacked by lower density beings. And so I created um, a series of meditations and this template to help the client. And it seemed to work because uh, he, he wasn't attacked by them after, after this. So these are some more downloads. I know we're short for time, but they say remaining indifferent or apathetic or on the fence means giving up one's free will. They say the very act of observing or being neutral or sitting on the fence is by its very nature an act of participation of some kind. Neutrality is choice in motion. So the question becomes to what degree do I want to participate in life, not should I participate, because you already are, whether you realize it or not. They're also talking about a shift from egoic leadership, which is dominating on our planet, to a leadership that is based in um, service, servant leadership, which is truly in, in service to all, and from the heart, and inclusive. They talk a lot about inclusivity. It's a very human concept to limit your love to just one person. It's part of the programming on Earth. This is a little bit of a controversial one <laughs> because we are just simply not used to thinking in these terms. We think that we have been programmed to be with one person and that one person for the rest of our lives. And they're not trying to negate that. They're not trying to say that's bad or wrong. They're just saying that enlightened civilizations don't live like that. They don't possess each other in that way. They're trying to get us to think outside the box. So there's some information here also on ayahuasca. And so ayahuasca is a blend of two plants, the ayahuasca vine, capi, and a shrub called chacruna, which is containing this, what people call is the hallucinogenic component. And it gives rise to visions and feelings and downloads and insights. And I truly believe that if we didn't have these amazing plant teachers, we would not be having the extent of the awakening and consciousness that we're experiencing right now. It's important to know that if everyone is agreeing with everything you share, then chances are you're not really living on your growing edge and really expressing from an authentic place. And that's what I encourage each of you to take away from this talk today, if anything. It's knowing that these plant medicines like ayahuasca, they've become very popular in recent years because people are fed up of the old ways, right? 
They want something different, and they want something fast. And the medicine, and it is medicine. We don't perceive it as a drug in indigenous cultures. This is a Western perspective. It's 100% natural. And it's giving a lifeline to many people. There's actually been studies that it actually helps people with depression and anxiety. And, you know, mushrooms were recently um, legalized too. And so the question is, can we live as these spiritual beings in a material world? And I really believe we can, but we have to start thinking outside the box. And earlier, I was saying that we're trying to put, you know, square pegs into round holes. That's why I have this image here, if you were wondering what was going on there. Um, and we really have to really go beyond the linear, the programming, the conditioning, the fear-mongering in our society. So we are each being prepared to become a bridge between worlds. And that pretty much wraps up the talk today. And if you are seeing me around, you can uh, ask me questions. So thank you so much for your attention.